The following program is underwritten by the Nevada Irrigation District. Since 1921, providing clean and healthy drinking and irrigation water to more than 24,000 homes, farms, schools, and businesses in Nevada and Placer counties. Lou Sitzer. This is Nevada County Television and we've got a really interesting and challenging program for us today. It's all about the Scotch Broom and it's called the Scotch Broom Challenge. We have Joanne Drummond who is Executive Director of the County's Fire Safe Council and uh, Rick Nolley who is on the Fire Safe Council Board. So we're going to talk a lot about what's happening in terms of the season and what you and all of us can do to help the area become more uh, a safe, fire safe. So Joanne, please give us an introduction to what the Fire Safe Council does and a little bit about what we're gonna be seeing. Well, the Fire Safe Council is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation and our mission is to provide uh, education and programs to assist landowners in making their property more fire safe. We also do community fuel projects, which create a greater benefit for the overall good. Um, we're here today to talk about the Scotch Broom Challenge, and this program was driven out of our home advisory visits. We have qualified trained volunteers that will go out to your property and help you understand the mechanics of implementing effective defensible space on your property. So we would go out and talk to homeowners about the condition around their home, and we had numerous people within a, a couple months start to um, talk to us about Scotch Broom. We would identify it to them as as an extremely flammable ladder fuel and by ladder fuel um, that's a term we use which uh, carries fire from the ground or from seasonal grasses pine needles and things like that up into smaller bushy vegetation which then carries the fire into the crown of the trees and it's important to try to keep fire on the ground because it gives firefighters um, certain tools to be able to combat it um, whereas if it's in the crown it's very difficult for them to um, battle it other than air attacks and on big catastrophic wildfires oftentimes it creates its own weather and you can't safely fly air support for it either. Right. Now I did uh, actually have a call, I called a fire safe council, I had someone come out to our property, walk the property with me, he was very very helpful, again a volunteer, yes. very very well educated and informed, this, this isn't a, a mandate, it isn't something where if you don't do what he says you get a ticket or a violation, he made suggestions that made a lot of sense around the gas tank, I actually had a bush, <laughs> this is the propane you know, tank that supplies, so yeah I went and I cut it down, <laughs> and so you know a lot of things which uh, I thought well gee the bush looks really nice there and it does cover the tank, mm -hmm. you know, but actually, when I'm thinking about fire safety for our home, the bush goes. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. 
And oftentimes privacy screening, um, whether it's from a neighbor or you know trying to hide some mechanical piece of equipment like your air conditioner unit or, or your propane tank is a goal of homeowners. And we like to believe that you can balance the values between being fire safe and still have an aesthetically pleasing landscape. Some of the challenges come from traditional education in urban areas on landscape design. They are taught to ladder things against the structure in order to frame it in a, in a pleasing way. However, it's really contradicting goals of fire safety in a wildland environment. In fact, Scotch broom um, is used as ornamental landscaping traditionally in a lot of urban areas, and when you don't have a high wildfire threat, um, it's probably a suitable uh, material. But as you move into the wildland, um, certain techniques like you know, islands of vegetation that are adequately spaced from the ignition zone of your structure become critically important. Right. Did you want to say something, Rick? I thought I heard. No, I just, I think I'd like to point out that the uh, defensible space is, uh, it's a misconception that people think that means a moonscape around their property where they're just taking everything out. Um, that's not the case at all. Joanne mentioned islands of vegetation. There are also certain types of vegetation that are fire resistant. So by joining those things together, um, and that, that kind of um, islands of vegetation approach, limbing up some small things, you can maintain a very lovely landscape at the same time as being fire safe. Yeah, and again, this service is available to county residents and uh, there's no cost involved. Mm -hmm. And we'll learn more about uh, what else is available as we go on with the show. So, uh, so what, uh, what exactly uh, do you do involved with this Scotch Broom Challenge? What's coming up? Well, what we did when we you know, heard from our community that they really were unknowledgeable about the threat that broomed place to them in their home environment, we created the challenge last spring. And we rolled it out in June. And we challenged the community to identify it, um, to work with us um, as community partners to control it. Um, eradication is probably a very lofty goal. It's extremely invasive and very aggressive at choking out native vegetation and forage for animals. So we um, sent out the challenge and we had several elements of that. One is the Weed Wrench Loan Program where landowners can come in and borrow the tool to pull out broom, such as I've done here today. Um, and it's very effective at pulling it up by the root um, and getting the whole plant out. But you do have a very active seed bank that's generated from the pods, sometimes 10 to 20,000 seeds, which can last up to 80 years. So 80 this, years in the soil. 80 years in the soil. Just waiting for the right conditions. Any disturbance really will bring them up. Um, any um, vegetation removal around them, light on the, on the floor or on the soil will help to regenerate it. Um, but we also really wanted to stop the bleeding in our mind by trying to uh, stop the sale of broom varieties as ornamental landscaping. So we contacted Jeff Pileman, the Nevada County Ag Commissioner, and he was extremely enthusiastic about our idea and um, told us about the program under the statute from the California Department of Food and Agriculture and what were some of the things that we would need to demonstrate as a community in order to have him be able to ban the sale. So our program through project work sites, um, community education, and the actual implementation of removing the broom qualified us. And so about two months ago, um, Mr. Pileman sent letters to all of the nursery wholesalers and retailers informing them that the sale of broom varieties is no longer allowed in Nevada County. Um, we were on the radio a couple of weeks ago with Master Gardeners and we had people call in mm -hmm. from Yuba County who <laughs> said, this stuff should be banned everywhere. Why aren't you getting on it? Um, but Jeff is part of a larger weed management coalition and so he is working with Yuba and and Placer counties to address it there as well and then the other approach was to provide uh, firewise landscaping labels so at the point of sale when you're looking at different containers of ornamental landscaping that you could see which ones were identified as being fire safe typically the native plants that were evolved in the fire ecosystem are good choices they tend to use less moisture and they are more resilient in the in the 
the natural environment. So could you mention a couple of those? Uh, Photinia is, um, well, that one's not actually a native, but that's a great one for screening and mm -hmm. privacy and things like that. Redbud? Redbud is a good one. That mm -hmm. is a native, mm -hmm. and it does provide good screening as well. Um, likes a little bit more moist environment, which sometimes if, you know, depending on where that's placed on your landscape, you know, if you've got irrigation available to it. Um, but there is a comprehensive um, landscaping guide that the council puts out in cooperation with the UC Master Gardeners program. And they are available at all the local nurseries, but if you're like me, I tend to walk around with my shopping cart and look for something that pleases me visually rather than maybe doing the homework that I should be doing to find out what plant I should be placing where. And uh, Lynn Lawrenson uh, with Master Gardeners helped us compile that. And her position is, right plant, right place. And I think it really is, as you would know, Rick, in real estate, location, location, <laughs> location. So what is the purpose of that plant? Is it shade for your home in the summer? Um, is it screening for privacy or for other equipment? Is it ground cover? You know, you really need to look at what your goal is or the desired condition for that portion of your property in order to really mm -hmm. choose something that's suitable. So just to better inform people, uh, scotch broom is actually not a native plant. And in fact, Rick, Rick you had a great story about the, <laughs> the, uh, the way it's always been told to me is that um, it was used as packing material to ship whiskey to the, to the gold miners. Um, whether that's true or not, it certainly makes it a more interesting story. Um, it was supposedly brought into the state as an ornamental, but I still think whiskey shipping makes a much, much better story. Uh, yeah, and it also talks, you know, would, would coincide with about the time the miners right, were here. Right. Absolutely. And it was supposedly brought in, in in the 1850s, so that seems to dovetail quite nicely with the gold rush. So. Right. And uh, as you mentioned before, it's not just scotch broom, because there are other varieties of broom that are actually quite lovely, as is scotch broom, if it weren't such a danger. Yes, Spanish broom, um, those sort of varieties are, are very similar genetically and in appearance, and it can be difficult to distinguish um, those subspecies. But really, it is the flammability of the plant that creates such a concern for the Fire Safe Council. Um, they have um, oils and things in them, and you can literally light it with a, with a lighter or a match. It's that flammable. And well, so while we're talking, maybe what we could do is look at a couple of, of, of shots of the Scotch broom in various stages, including bloom, mm -hmm. which I'm sure everyone will recognize <laughs> from the highway. Yes, and this one um, looks like it's taken probably um, during the uh, winter when it really doesn't have a lot of the lush green foliage that you'll see. Um, when it's in bloom and during the springtime when it's wet, you'll see that it gets a lot of kind of uh, crinkly small leaves which will then um, flower and create seed pods um, that will um, that will proliferate for, you know, like we said, about 80 years in the seed bank. Um, it tends to choke out natural vegetation. It gets pretty big. Yeah. It can get really big. There's a shot there of the seed pod and that lovely um, yellow flower, which may be one of the reasons that people are pretty attracted to it as an ornamental landscape material. Um, we do know from, from uh, medical doctors that I spoke to that they say that the allergens from scotch broom are really problematic. They see a lot of patients during the spring when it's in bloom because as you can imagine with all that flowering going on, you've got a lot of pollen that's being dispersed as well. Now I was really happy when I talked with Joanne and found out that there is a scotch broom puller or any kind of a broom puller. You might even use it for other plants that are uh, noxious. Um, and uh, after the show, I'm going to take it home this weekend <laughs> and go crazy because I walked the property uh, this morning and saw all the scotch broom coming up. And the bigger scotch broom are really hard to pull up. So this puller is fantastic. Yeah, it's all about the, the science and the construction. Ed, if, if you'd sure. like to see, um, this was a plant that I pulled up. Um, on my way to the studio <laughs> off of Sierra College Boulevard, and I was dressed in, in this outfit. Um, so as you can see, this is really just starting to flower here, but the tool is able to remove most all of the root system, which is really important um, to get it out. 
Um, but it's very easy. I think the, the hardest thing that I have is in getting that, that final stalk. You really need to pull away some of the, the duff from the ground in order to lock this jaw mechanism right around the base of the plant. But once you do, you can really just step on the lever which closes the jaw system and then you simply use the leverage motion to pull it out of the ground. And um, as you can see, this one's way taller than I am and I had no difficulty at all pulling it out. Um, I also did pull just a couple branches off of some of the, the more spindly, younger growth um, that wasn't as prominent as this. This was in a shaded area and wasn't um, flowering or, or really regenerating like that sample was that has been out in the light and able to get enough moisture to really kick off now that spring seems to be here. Now the smaller, younger plants this time of year are fairly easy to pull out. They are, um, although that one is probably up to my thigh, I couldn't pull it out. Uh -huh. um, and so it's um, something that you know you really need to have a tool or a mechanism to do it. We have a core team assembled to implement this challenge in some of our work project sites that we've identified. And there's been great debate amongst the, the committee, um, our technical advisory committee, that's looking at methods for removal. Um, the favored method is actual pulling of individual plants, although we do have some representatives and some research from the U.S. Forest Service that says you can have success if you cut it below the first node or where the first branch would be coming mm. out, but you need to be doing that at a, at a certain time of the year. So you need to be doing it during a dry season when the plant doesn't have sufficient resources to really regenerate. Mm. Um, there has been some discussion about you know, lopping it off and then using a chemical treatment. Um, we tend to shy away from that because there's a lot of areas that we're doing work that is near riparian areas where it's just not mm. suitable. Um, there's also been a great deal of discussion about what do we put to replace that. Should we put, be putting in native grasses or in some of the, the wetland areas like on Wolf Creek? They're looking at willows and, and alders and things like that so we can get some, some native vegetation back in there where the scotch broom has taken over. Yeah, I know that there are some other plants that are just as difficult to get up <laughs> that I'm going to be using this on. Uh, how many are available? How do people get them? Well, we have um, four in our office that, you know, are loaned out free of charge, but a lot of our partners also have the Weed Wrenches um, Circle. The South Yuba River Citizens League has about a dozen. Um, North San Juan Fire has several. And so there's a lot of us that come together and are, you know, trying to offer these for people. You talked about what else can you pull out with them. We've had reports of great success in thinning saplings. So if you have, you know, a fairly dense regeneration in a particular area, you know, before they get too big, mm -hmm. it's very successful in pulling up small cedars or pine trees as well if you want to thin out a stand mm -hmm. before they get too large and then you're having to break out the chainsaw. Maybe we can bring up the phone number and website of the Fire Safe Council so that people will know. Where are, actually are you located? We are located at 154 Hughes Road in Grass Valley. And give us some landmarks around that. Um, it's um, just up from the movie theaters on East Main Street by the Shell Station. We sit behind the Quick Stop Market near the golf course. Okay. There's a two-story office building back there. It's the location in the same area where the Red Cross used to have their office. So mm -hmm. some people are pretty familiar with that location. Right, great. So what are some of the, I mean, I don't know if we've left the challenge. Is there a period of time that this challenge goes on or is it going to be year long? How does it work? Well, we are planning on about a five year challenge to try to make a difference in the community. We were successful in getting the sale banned, so that has stopped the bleeding, so to speak, although there's nothing to stop someone from going to Home Depot in Roseville and bringing it back. So the education needs to be ongoing. We've got people moving into our area all of the time, so we need to keep that up. But we have actually some work sites, some project sites that our partners are working on. And um, Rick, through his Penn Valley Rotary Club, working with the Lake Wildwood Homeowners Association, has embraced a project site on Pleasant Valley Road. And I think Rick has a really yeah. great story right. on an individual and why we, we picked that site. Um, the, uh, as I was telling Lou earlier, I was driving down Pleasant Valley Road and came by this, this guy who was just ripping plants out of the ground. And I was going really fast. And, 
was trying to figure out what the heck he was doing. And I got home, and my wife sent me right back out to the store. So I thought, ah, I've got a chance to stop and talk to this guy. So I stopped, and this gentleman, David Moss, who lives in Lake Wildwood, was out pulling um, scotch broom. And I told him, I wondered if 98% of the people driving down Pleasant Valley Road understood what a wonderful thing he was doing. He said, well, what do you mean? And I said, do you know what you're pulling out? It's a very flammable, noxious weed. And he said, oh, just, I was just worried it was going to catch my trees on fire. And that was a very high probability. So he's kind of become our poster child because he's clean on, on the highway side of the fence, and he's also cleaned on his side of the fence. He's done a tremendous job of pulling out scotch broom and other um, underbrush, etc. So he kind of inspired me to go to our Rotary Club and suggest that as a community service project. So on March 29th, the Rotary Club, in conjunction with Lake Wildwood Association, um, and any citizens that want to volunteer, we're going to have a scotch broom pulling party from the main gate of Lake Wildwood to the north gate of Lake Wildwood. And if time permits, then we're going to come back up on the other side of the road. Um, there'll be snacks and beverages during the morning, and then we're going to have lunch for the participants. And um, hopefully we can get a turnout of 20 or 30 volunteers and turn it into a really good, useful project. For the Rotary Club, it's a great community service project because we're getting out doing something for the community. And for the homeowners in that area, it's a great project to protect their homes. And there are so many neighborhood associations. I'm just thinking about our mm -hmm. road association Absolutely. where we could be doing that along the road everyone shares. And fire safety is actually something that goes year round. Absolutely. We, we know how dangerous the area is. We know the kind of wildfires that have been happening in California. It's not even a question of if, it's a question of when. And we have to do our best to really prevent the kind of catastrophic uh, results that we have seen just in the last year. Yes. And Scotch Broom typically does um, proliferate along roadsides. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they'll come by and clear vegetation or have some maintenance, and then what pops in is Scotch mm -hmm. Broom. So it really does have a recurrence issue because the seeds get picked up in tires and then taken down the roadways. But it is a good point that every neighborhood association or whatnot, if they are aware of what the problem is, that's half the battle. They can identify it. Um, as part of our, our pulling project days, um, our work days, we are going to have you know some education there from our technical core team about you know how to eradicate it, how to revegetate, and really give people some strategies. So there will be a learning learning component along with the labor so that um, hopefully those people can carry that message back to their own their own property and their own road associations. I know they are working on a uh, fire plan for the county and I think we're becoming more aware of uh, how educated and of, of the options we, we need to consider are. Are you involved with that at all? Well, we are involved to the point that the council received um, grant funding to implement a community wildfire protection plan. And the CWPP, as we call it, is really an analysis and strategy for implementing fuels reduction projects. So our work has been recognized by the Fire Plan Committee and the county, and our document will serve as an appendix to the general fire plan. Um, but throughout the fire plan, the county has recognized the efforts of the council, and rightly so. We have great programs like our year-round chipping program, special mm. needs assistance for those that are are elderly or, or disabled that can't afford to get clearing done by, their, by themselves. We have the advisory visit that you've talked about that really kind of helps people understand what defensible space should look like and gives them the option so they can make choices on their own property. So they have recognized the work of the council to educate the community, um, but we were not directly involved mm -hmm. because we are an independent nonprofit. We are not part of county government. We really have to go out there and mm -hmm. write grants and get the money to do what we do otherwise we don't exist. Wow. Well also we'll talk we should talk a little bit about the chipping program. This is something that I use uh, twice a year. Good. Every year uh, it's great and I have a lot of manzanita on the property which is what would be considered uh, ladder fuel. <laughs> a lot of it fuel. is dead uh, and is just sort of waiting to be ignited and so I'm uh, always in the process of uh, of uh, weeding out the manzanita 
uh, and it provides some great firewood uh, in the winter time, so it's worth it. But please mention how the chipping program works, and again, we'll have the numbers on the screen. Great. Um, we have a year-round chipping program, um, weather pending. You know, when it's snowing out there or raining really heavy, we don't get out. But we have two contracted routes, so we work with local contractors. We put it out to bid to try to get the best price possible. Um, you schedule a work order with the council office. The form is available on our website. If you go to the home page and then click on services at the button selection there, um, it will open up a new page and the chipping program will be described on the left-hand side. There's lots of pictures because we do request that your, your brush be neatly stacked by a roadway <laughs> or driveway because we do consider it a drive-by service. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people want to be called when we're coming and things like that, but sometimes we have a hundred requests in a week and trying to coordinate with each landowner really is not cost effective. So you schedule with um, the council. We have rotating weekly schedules. So for instance, the first week, the first full week of the month, we're in Grass Valley and Nevada City. Um, then we go to Cedar Ridge, uh, Pearsdale area, and we go to Rough and Ready. The third week we're down in Penn Valley, Lake Wildwood area, and Alta Sierra and South County. And then the fourth week of the month we're out at the Washington, sort of north of Nevada City, as well as, where's the other, oh, North San Juan, our other sort of outlying <laughs> area. So you're busy. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are busy. Um, you know, even with the storm crush that we had from January, many people wouldn't think of January or February as being busy for the chipping program, but with trees going down from the storm or branches, right. windfall, right. you know, it's a great way to dispose of them. Um, we find that the opportunity window to burn is becoming more tenuous. Mm -hmm. Last year we had the driest January on record and so you mm -hmm. know fire season was very early to come and so you really didn't have a great window of opportunity to take care of piles that maybe you would like to burn. Um, so we like to yeah. provide an option and of course you know smoke nuisances, health issues, right. our air quality, it, it is more difficult to pull it off as density becomes greater in our county when there was all five 20 acre parcels wasn't an issue, but now that we're living on half acre and smaller parcels in some areas like Alta Sierra, Lake Wildwood, it really is difficult to pull off a residential debris burn. Neighbors don't like it. They don't. <laughs> okay. They get, get kind of smoked yeah. out. Right. <laughs> well, uh, Joanne and Rick, I'd like to thank you very much. This is going to be a program, a series. Joanne will be back. We'll be talking about fire safety throughout the year and it's something we need to pay lots of attention to. Again, the uh, chipper is uh, something that is available. There are up to 35 of them in the county, so uh, call in. And I want to thank also uh, Honor Omez, uh, Gail Woodman, Marilyn Blom, and Terry Hecklin for crewing the show. Uh, this is your local NCTV station. We need volunteers, we need lots of uh, great content, so if you've got uh, ideas and some spare time, come on by. Thanks a lot for watching NCTV Interviews. Thank you.